พอวัดปัดพอดวันนี้ฟังเรื่องเราเรื่องเรื่องเรื่องเรื่องเรื่องเรื่องเรื่องเรื่องเรื่องเรื่อ I'm still in slight disbelief that we have navigated this strange year together, and have not gathered physically in all of this time yet. God has kept us, and He will keep keeping us. Uh, to our guests, thank you for sharing part of your morning uh, with the renovation community. If it is your first time with any faith family, thank you for taking a chance on this one. Uh, renovation is not a perfect church for perfect people; uh, it is a place for flawed people in need of grace. It is a community to which you can belong even before you believe. It is one to which you can belong while you work out what you believe. So, if you need direction in connecting with us, please visit with us in our digital lobby after the gathering. The link will be made available in each of the three chat windows, uh, depending on your chosen worship platform. Today, we begin a three-part series entitled "Friend of Sinners." Fair warning to you if you are listening or watching and have not yet started to follow Jesus. This is a series directed toward Christians. This series aims to challenge Jesus people to live out the way of Jesus, and I encourage you though to stick with us through it so that you have clarity on who Jesus is, how he lived his life when he was on earth, and how his people should be living theirs. Over the next few weeks, we will intently explore what Jesus said, how he lived, and who he spent his time with. While being about the business of being the savior of the world, I hope by the end of this series that we all have a fresh perspective about what was important to Jesus, so that what was important to Jesus, especially when it comes to people, will be vital to us. Jesus had a particular love for people far from God. He had a passion for the lives of people who did not know God's love or know of God's desire to be known by them. Jesus spent innumerable waking hours being driven toward them by that same love. Perhaps we, as His people, should be doing the same. With that, would you mind opening up your paper or digital Bible to Matthew's Gospel, chapter nine? Our time today will center on verses nine through thirteen. Again, Matthew nine nine through thirteen. Hear the word of the Lord. <clears throat> As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, "Follow me." And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, "Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners?" But when he heard this, Jesus said, "Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners." The word of the Lord, and if you would say with me, "Thanks be to God." Pray for me as I pray for you, that God would move in power over us in this moment. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you. Uh, for your spirit, thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, that you have invited us to journey with you as your children to share this hope with the rest of the world. That many of your other scattered children will be gathered home. Would this day, this moment, this series truly transform how we engage in the world? We ask it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And I hope you would say with me, Amen and Amen. Most of us do not spend intentional time with people far from God. Our lives may be such that we have no relationships of consequence with anyone who does not follow Jesus. Now, upon hearing those words, you can be bothered by them. You can even begin to rationalize why I am wrong and why your situation is different, or how I could have come at the moment with a bit more finesse. Or we can just sit in it for a moment and ponder the importance and implication of this fact. Most of us do not spend intentional time with people far from God. I do not say this from any position of superiority or posture of judgment. I'm right there with you. Recently, in fact, I was lamenting to one of our other leaders how easy it is to professionalize Christianity as a pastor. And convince yourself that because you are preaching the gospel to hundreds, even thousands of people on a given week, that you have done what you need to do to see people drawn close to Jesus. Though the lament was recent, 
as I was preparing this series, in fact, I came to grips with this about myself several years ago. I examined my life and realized that every relationship of consequence in my life was with someone who was either a part of the renovation community, another pastor or family member who followed Jesus, or some other person who's a Christian. I spent no significant time with people far from God, people whom God loves but who do not know he loves them. Sure, I knew some folks casually, but I was not invested in their lives or their flourishing. My entire life had become a church slash ministry bubble, and my story is not unique. Like most Christians, pastors are no more likely to have relationships with people far from God, perhaps less likely. With the relationship being the primary means of people meeting Jesus and relationship being nearly the only way Christians, according to data, are even willing to share their faith, you can quickly see why who we spend our time with is so essential to living out the way of Jesus. Now, there are exceptions, of course. My friend Alex earlier, a pastor in Seattle, spends a great deal of time uh, in his life hanging with people who do not know Jesus. It is beautiful and inspiring. I've been on the phone with him countless times, having him tell me to hold on as he engages person after person. He will then tell me the story of how they met and when they hang and how he loves them and wants them to know and love Jesus. It is beautiful. He is living the way of Jesus and it's vitally important. Why? Because Jesus wants us invested in the lives of people far from God. He wants us to have relationships of consequence with people who do not know God or his love and leadership. He, we must share our lives with the many people around us who do not know God because it's the way of Jesus. Matthew, who wrote his own detailed account about Jesus' life on earth, knew all too well Jesus' way as he himself was a beneficiary of it. Following a series of healings, stilling a storm, and casting demons out of two men who were so fierce that none could even pass by their way, Jesus gets into a boat and heads toward his hometown. As he was making his way toward the city center, he encounters a group of people carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, and Jesus heals the man. People celebrate, and then he proceeds on his path toward the city center. And there, on the outskirts of the city, he comes across a tax booth. In this booth is a man named Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. Specifically, he was a customs officer of some kind, collecting import and export taxes on trade goods crossing between Herod Antipas and Herod Philip's territories. Quick history lesson. Rome divided the region of Capernaum following the death of their father, Herod the Great, who was the monster that tried to kill baby Jesus, and when he could not find Jesus, killed every infant in Bethlehem. So though the region's division solved Rome's political problems, it divided the territory that Jewish people considered one. Jewish people were taxed when they did business with other Jewish people across the regions. They saw such taxes as Roman robbery of money that rightfully belonged to them. Thus, the Jewish people hated the tax collectors because they were Rome's instruments of oppression. The hatred understandably increased when the tax collector was a fellow Jew, as Matthew was. In fact, the kindest word Jews used for tax collector was sinner. And it was to this sinner Jesus spoke and said, follow me. Matthew immediately got up and followed. Though Jesus is God, he did not account equality with God as something to be grasped. He divested himself of his godly rights and power when he was incarnate here on earth. So this call to follow him was not seasoned with divine power, which must lead us to believe that there was a relationship of some kind already established. Though Matthew was a sinner, unclean by Jewish standards, he was a friend to the Savior of the world. Matthew left an entire way of life to follow Jesus. History tells us that tax collectors were generally wealthy men as there was an incredible profit margin in the business. Matthew was making a great material sacrifice when he walked out of his office that day and the action was final. Another soon would fill his lucrative post. To the business leaders out there, what are you willing to sacrifice to follow Jesus? Is the profit margin worth more than eternal life? Matthew's did not make his decision in a spirit of grim resignation. He took great joy in his decision to follow Jesus, so much so that he threw a big party and invited many of his friends and co-workers. His guests were as disreputable as he had been. These were not people one would expect to be celebrating a religious leader as an honored guest. They were tax collectors and sinners, social and religious outcasts in the Jewish theocracy. But there was Jesus, reclining at a dinner party, surrounded by unsavory people, People who live beyond the edge of respectable society. Those who you would not catch anywhere near church service. Can we say the same? Do we place ourselves in the path of people who we would not catch anywhere near church gathering? 
Do we have relationships with people who are presently far from God? Do we have dinner parties with people who may be beyond the edge of respectful society? Are any of our friends morally suspect? If we are to live the way of Jesus, then the answer to these questions must be yes. Like Matthew, as disciples, we are the means of people's path to Jesus. If we do not live the way of Jesus proximate to people who do not, they will not get to feast with Jesus and his people. But the Pharisees, who were the most church folks of the day, were incensed by Jesus' actions for several reasons. They considered those people unclean. They thought sin was contagious and would contaminate anyone who came into contact with it. Sidebar, sin is not contagious. <laughs> Yet Paul also writes, bad company corrupts good character, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. How do we hold the way of Jesus in Paul's words and tension? Wisdom and holiness. You see, we as Jesus people must be wise of the where and the why and the how when we invest intentionally in those far from God. We as Jesus people must be consistently cultivating lives of personal holiness. Further, a dinner party is not synonymous with going to the club where and having someone see more of Jesus in you through a relationship is not the same as finding a place and a person or persons with which you can hide your faith and live duplicitously. And being a friend of sinners in isolation is not the same as inviting them into your community or inviting your community into their world. Further, holiness is contagious and grace is infectious. Jesus knew this, and he knew the positive power of holiness to influence another for good. Also, in view in their reaction is the Jewish understanding of the time that eating with another person was to enter into covenant friendship with them. It meant accepting someone, listen to this, as they are and affirming their worth as a person. A meal was a big deal. There were no casual church lunches. And by eating with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus was accepting them as they are. To eat with sinners meant to refrain from condemning them. In their eyes, then, Jesus was claiming to be a teacher of the law. They could not fathom how a religious man would associate with irreligious people. For the Pharisees, Jesus eating with sinners made him a sinner. Anyone who willingly sat with outcasts indicated their acceptance of them and in a sense identified themselves with them. It is how Jesus was then. It is how Jesus is now. That is the good news of the gospel, that Jesus is a friend of sinners, accepting all as they are, loving you just as he finds you, identifying with you in your sin through his death on the cross and offering you his grace and goodness through your believing in him. He does not ask you to be different or be better to be in his coming company. He does not ask you to change yourself. He died for you and me while we were still and are still in our sin. Jesus became sin so that sinners could become righteousness. He forgives your sin if you repent of it, meaning you ask for his forgiveness and for faith to believe in him and turn away from sinful choices and behavior. Turn away from following your own way and follow Jesus' love and leadership today even. Your life can change forever just as Matthews did. Just as many millions have since. This is your opportunity. Now, you might wonder if the Pharisees thought so lowly of Jesus and the people with whom he spent his time, how would they have seen the events of the party? They certainly would not have been at the party or even in the house, right? Right. Though Matthew does not readily explain how the Pharisees knew what Jesus was doing, we should not too readily impose modern Western notions of domestic privacy on this scene. Life in ancient Palestine was much more public than our general experiences. And given the significant number of people present at this party, pre-COVID must have been, we can imagine that they used an outer courtyard. Perhaps the Pharisees encountered the guest or Jesus and his disciples as the party broke up and dispersed. Interestingly, the Pharisees do not go directly to Jesus, but instead complain to his disciples and to the wonderful members of my leadership small group, Triangle Alert. It seems people have been avoiding direct conflict for centuries. Of course, their question <clears throat> is not a question. It is an attempt or an attempt to seek information about why Jesus is eating with sinners. It is an accusation. A religious person, a teacher especially, might well pass on information to a religious person, but to share a meal with them, well, that was another matter. Though they did not address their question to him, Jesus heard what the Pharisees said and he chose to respond. Without waiting for his disciples to think of something to say, Jesus takes a humble illustration from an ordinary life and applies it to the moment and to his mission. It is the sick 
not the well who need medical attention. The application of this illustration to spiritual things is not difficult to see. Jesus' response in some ways begins in agreement with the Pharisaic assessment of his friends and the need to treat that assessment with seriousness. Yet, there's an implied rebuke in Jesus' answer that we cannot miss. The Pharisees will undoubtedly see themselves as well in the sense that Jesus used the word and the tax collectors and sinners as sick. So the question then to them is, why were these healthy people doing nothing to heal the sick? Further, why can they not see that his concern is not to see them continue in their sickness? Jesus promotes an alternative vision. Sinners are needy and able to be helped rather than contaminated and deserving to be spurned. The image of God's people is ill and therefore in need of a healing. It's familiar in the Old Testament scriptures as well. Jesus built on this background to express his love and concern to bring people in from the margins. Let us not lose sight, though, of the implication that there is a healing process through which the ill regain health. Jesus loves you where he finds you and loves you too much to leave you there. Having dealt summarily with the posture of the Pharisees' hearts and their triangling efforts to talk about him instead of to him, Jesus tells them to go and learn. Go and learn does not mean go off on a journey of some kind. Instead, it is a call for a genuine effort to understand. Go and learn is likely a piece of technical diction. The Pharisees earlier referred to Jesus as your teacher. Jesus now allows them to become learners. And he proceeds to quote Hosea 6.6, 6, wherein the prophet calls God's people to show love and loyalty. They should, of course, love God who loves them so much. But this also means that they should love other people as God loves them. Jesus insists that the self-satisfied Pharisees show compassion to those on the edge of religious acceptability instead of rejecting them resolutely. And when Jesus left his heavenly home to come to earth, it was not to congratulate people like the Pharisees who were so well satisfied with themselves that they were ready to condemn all who failed to measure up to their standards. No, nor did he come to deal with people who were genuinely right with God. His business was, was with sinners, with those who were far from God. And since they were ready to see people remain from far from God, their attitudes lacked compassion and thus failed to comply with the prophet's standards whom they professed to so highly honor. This failure meant that the Pharisees then what belonged among the people Hosea condemned, a startling accusation for those outwardly religious. Being in the company of sinners and lovingly seeking their restoration is the business of God and his people. And if we are not about that business, can we honestly say that we are God's people? Now, that question alone is enough to ensure that this matters to us, especially as Christians. The people of God have a calling, a vocation, if you will, to show the world God's love in every meaningful way. Now, it is improbable that, like the Pharisees, many of us see sin as a contagion that spreads quickly from person to person. Yet, if we are not in intentional relationship with people far from God, how are we different from the Pharisees? More troubling still, if we are in those relationships, but they are an escape from the call of our faith, rather than approaching them as a means to show and share the love of God, how are we different? We're not. In some sense, do we not lack that same compassion? With the relationship being the primary means of people meeting Jesus, and relationship being nearly the only way Christians, according to that, are even willing to share their faith, then we can see why. Those with whom we spend our time is so essential to living out the way of Jesus. Jesus wants us invested in the lives of people far from God. He wants us to have relationships of consequence with people who do not know God or his love and kindness. We must share our lives with the many people around us who do not know God. Why? Because it is the way of Jesus. So what do we do? I'll well, offer just one next step today. Party with people far from God. Yes. The sermon's called Party Up, and I'm telling you to party with people who are far from God. Now, before some of you get too excited, remember the caveats earlier. <laughs> Be wise of the where and the why and the how when you party with people far from God. Jesus' people consistently cultivate personal holiness. A dinner party is not synonymous with you getting out into the club to be missional. A relationship with someone or someone's far from God is not a means for you to hide your faith and live duplicitously. And most importantly, being a friend of sinners in isolation is not the same as inviting them into your community or inviting your community into their world. Family, I'm asking you, let your holiness be contagious and God's grace be infectious.
It is positive power to influence another for good. Now, if you're not yet following the way of Jesus, there's an opportunity for you to take a next step as well. Jesus loves you. He loves you enough to have died for you before you even knew who he was or wanted to know for that matter. Jesus wants you to be a part of his family, the church. He wants you to experience the forgiveness for your sin and his righteousness as a gift. He wants you to have all that he has to offer. The question is, will you receive it today? Will you, like Matthew, get up and follow Jesus? He's calling you now. If you'll accept that call from Jesus today, would you pray with me for just a moment of prayer of faith that could be transformative for your life? Very quickly, you don't even have to pray it aloud. Father, I want to follow Jesus. Like Matthew, this ancient man who left his tax business to follow Jesus, I want to do the same. I want my life now and for eternity to be forever transformed. Will you please give me faith to believe? Will you please give me the ability to follow Jesus' love and leading? Will you make me new today and bring me home? I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer today in faith and after our gathering, we just want to connect with you, either one of our pastors or our hosts, so that we can tell you what this next step means in your life with Jesus and his church. Last word here, Renovation Church's vision is to see the world awaken to the wonder of God and his transcultural church. What if we believe that vision with our full hearts? What if that vision, which is not unique, by the way, but a play on the words of God's revealed vision in the scriptures, what if that vision was the organizing principle for our lives? Do you believe we will be in relationships of consequence with God's beloved children far from him? Do you believe that we would go out of our way to see as many people as possible experience the infectious nature of grace and the overwhelming sense of God's love? Do you think the church would be relevant in the world again? The answer to all of the above is yes. But first, we must believe. Let it be so. Amen. I love you. And I'll see you next week.